Privit. I'm Chuck Olenek. I'm a Ukrainian-American who was baptized with the name Yaroslav, which is also the name that I use in the historical reenactment group, the Society for Creative Anachronism. For years, I have been wading through all sorts of Slavic folklore and mythology and the stories and the history. And I've decided that I need to share this knowledge. Otherwise, it's just going to sit in notebooks that are just going to grow dusty. And what I decided to do was put together videos of, you know, the various topics, whether it's the mythology or the history, and put them up on my YouTube channel, which, by the way, would be really cool if you subscribe to that. And, you know, I've been covering the gods and goddesses and, you know, folk tales. Well, then there is this one big epic tale that I have been working up the nerve to tackle. And that's the tale of Ihor's campaign. Or Igor, if you're pronouncing it like Americans do. And it's an anonymous epic poem that was written in the Old East Slavic language. And it's to the Ukrainians and the Russians what the Song of Roland is to France and the Tale of the Cid is to Spain and, you know, kind of like, it's kind of like our Beowulf. And the title gets translated in a number of different ways. So when you start looking for it, you might get confused. The Tale of the Campaign of Ihor could be the Song of Ihor's Campaign, um, the Lay of Ihor's Campaign, the Lay of the Host of Ihor, the Lay of the Warfare Waged by Ihor. And no matter what you call it, it's an account of a failed raid uh, done by Ihor Sviatoslavich of Novhorod Seversk that took place in 1185. Um, Ihor happened to die in 1202. And it was against the uh, Polovtsians. Some call them the uh, Kumans uh, or the Kipchaks of the Don River region. Other historical figures uh, include the um, the Bard Boyan, the Princess um, Ves Veseslav of Volozk, who, by the way, was reputed to be a werewolf, and Yaroslav Osmomisil of Halich, and the Sevolod, the Big Nest of Suzdal. And in their writing, the author, who, by the way, kind of makes Christianity and the pagan stuff compatible because there's references to both. Um, appeals to the warring princes of Rus and pleads with them you know, for unity in the face of the constant threat of what's coming from the East. And in a way that kind of foreshadows the Mongol invasions that will take place four decades after this was written. So this was uh, recorded in the a Kievan Chronicle about 1200. So let's get to the story. Let me tell then, brethren, the tale of Ihor. Behold, his soul is filled with warlike spirit, and mighty was his mind. His heart he wedded keen upon the stone of courage, and naught would content him, but that he should lead his valiant host to the land of the Polovtsi, to do honor to Russia, his country. And so at morn he rose and setting forth came to where the banners flew at Putivil. There he met his dear brother, Vesevolod. Quoth Vesevolod, the bold, Ihor, my one brother, my brightest light, thou other son of Sviatoslav, hearken unto me. Make ready thy noble steeds. Mine are saddled and waiting at Kursk, and my men are skilled at arms. They were cradled in helms, suckled at the spear point, and the sound of trumpets was their lullaby. All roads are known to them in all wild places. Their bows are bent, their quivers full, their swords sharpened. Behold, they race like 
gray wolves in the wilderness seeking for themselves honor and for their prince's glory. Then Ihor cast his eyes upon the sun and saw that its splendor was dimmed so that his men stood all veiled in shadow. But the soul of Ihor was aflame and his thirst for adventure so great that he heeded not the evil omen. Then Ihor said to his Drujina, Brothers and companions, it is better to be slain than taken captive. Mount, brothers, your swift horses, that we may glimpse the blue dawn. In his fervor, the prince's foresight ebbed from him, and his zeal to taste the great dawn from his helm veiled the omen from him. I wish, he said, to break my lance at the end of the Polovitsian step with you, men of Rus. I wish to lay down my head or drink with my helm from the dawn. Having spoken thus, the prince leaped into his golden saddle and galloped swiftly across the plain. His path was darkened by the shadowy sun, and the night groaned about him with howls of beasts and the cry of Div shrieking in the treetops. Mighty is the cry of Div. It is heard in lands unknown, on the Volga, by the sea coast, near the Sula, yea, even by the idol of Tutmorkan, the Polovtsians, by uncharted roots, race towards the great dawn. Their carts screech at midnight like startled swans about to take wing. Ihor led his armies to meet them. The wolves growled in the ravines. The eagles called loudly to the wild beasts that they might share the carrion, and the foxes barked at the scarlet shields as they rode past. O oh, land of Rus, you are already behind the hill. The night darkens long and is suddenly black. The morning star has shed its light. Mist lies heavily on the steppe. The nightingale's trill is stilled. The chatter of Dawes begins. The men of Rus with scarlet shields have barred the great step, seeking honor for themselves and for their prince, glory. Past dawn on that day, they trampled pagan Polovtsian troops, scattering like arrows over the land. They seized beautiful Polovtsian maidens, and with them gold brocades, patterned velvets. Across the swamps and marshes, they began to lay bridges with cloaks, mantles, furs, and all kinds of fine Polovtsian raiments, the scarlet banner, the white pennon, the scarlet fringe, the silver lance, all to the brave son of Sviatoslav. And when night fell at last, the eagles of Rus slept on the battlefield. They had flown far and now rested, for their honor was safe and secure. Why indeed should they brook the insult of hawk or falcon or of the black crows, the, po the heathen Polovtsi? But Znyak runs as a gray wolf. Konchak shows him the way to the great dawn. On the morrow, the dawn arose in bloodstained raiment to proclaim the day. Dark clouds rolled heavily up from the sea, laden with blue, quivering flashes of lightning. The rain fell like arrows from the sky and the winds. The children of Strebog blew as keen daggers. The earth groaned. The waters thickened. A pall of mud lay over the fields, and the very folds of Ihor's standards shook in agony. Amid the storm, the armies fought again. Alas, all went not well that day for Ihor. Many a spear was shattered. Many a sword blunted on the shores of the Kayala near the dawn. But the Polovtsi came rushing from all sides. From the river came fierce Zyak, and from the sea came Konchak the Cruel, and the Russians fell back before them, retreating towards the hill where lay the land of Russia. The shouts of the heathen devils filled the steps, but the armies of Ihor still resisted nobly, barring the way with the scarlet of their shields. Ves Volod, Fierce as a wild boar stood foremost in the fray. Wherever shone the gold of his helm, there was the fiercest fighting, and the Polovtsi heads covered the ground. His arrows showered upon the foe, his good sword crashed upon their helms. For Vesvalod 
was indeed fierce as a wild boar and wrecked little of the wounds he gave, nor of those he received, nor of his past honor in the town of Chernihiv, nor of his father's golden throne, nor of the sweetness of his beloved, the fair daughter of Hleb. Then in the time of Oleg, son of woe, the land was sown and it sprouted with discord. The living of Dajboch, grandson, was ruined. The ages of mankind were cut short by the feuds of the princes. Throughout the land of Rus, the plowmen seldom called out, but the ravens often cawed, portioning the corpses amongst themselves, and grackles called in their tongue, waiting to fly to the feast. From dawn till night, from sunset till daybreak, the battle continued. Terrible was the slaughter, and many a noble life was lost. Of all the warriors, Isaislav, the son of Vasilko, remained the last to fight and bravely shed his blood so that the honor of his fathers might still be his. Though numberless were the helms which he did bring to the ground, yet was he himself stretched at last upon the blood-stained earth. And as he lay covered by his crimson shield, he spoke sorrowfully, saying, The vultures have enveloped thy warriors, Prince Ihor, and the beasts of prey have drunk their blood. None was near him. Far were his brothers, Bryasislav and Vesvelod. So he died alone, and his soul passed out of his brave body like a pearl that falls softly. No voice was heard, no laughter. Behold the trumpets of Horodno calling in sorrow for the dead. Thus in the foreign land was the Chernozem, the black soil, sown with bones and watered with blood. But the fruits thereof ripened in Russia, fruits of sorrow. At the end of the second night, Ihor ordered his host to retire, for he saw that his dear brother, Vesvolod, was weakening, and he was filled with pity. The call of the trumpets bidding the armies to retire was heard at dawn, but only at noon on the third day was the banner of Ihor lowered. The prince was taken prisoner. From a king's saddle he fell to that of a slave, and thus on the shores of the Kayala were the brothers parted. Great had been the feast of blood, and deep the drinking of the wine of blood. The Russians had in truth glutted their guests with wine. Nevertheless, many were dead in the defense of Russia. The grass wept for grief, and the trees were bowed in mourning. These brethren were evil days for Russia. By the Kayala all was blackness. The sun was darkened, gone the red glory of the northern lights. The Polovetsi armies harried the land and burnt the villages, and Div wailed, mourning the mad courage of the princes that had led them to destruction. Bitter Obida had come amongst the forces of Dajbog's grandson. She had stepped like a maiden onto the land of Trojan. She had splashed her swan's wings upon the blue sea, ruffling near the dawn. She had awakened baneful times, like a swan damsel, stirred the waves of enmity with the fluttering of her wings. Warfare of the princes against the pagan had ceased. Now brother says to brother, this is mine, and this is mine too. Princes had begun to say of trifles, this is a great thing. One against the other, they have begun to forge discord. Being thus divided amongst themselves, they allowed their enemies to gain upon them, and the land of Russia was invaded from all sides. Woe unto the army of Ihor! The hawks pursued his noble warriors into the sea, striking them dead, and following the hawks came Satan, who flew over the land with his goblet of fire, pouring forth flames upon the people. The good wives wept. Now can we think no more of our sweethearts, they cried. Never again shall we see them. Never again shall we succor them in their distress. Never can we hope to become rich with gold and silver. And Kiev sorrowed, and Chernihiv groaned in distress. Woe unto Russia for the victories of her enemies. Throughout the land the pagans took a levy, even one squirrel skin from each man, for the hour of vengeance had come for the Polovtsi.
in former times, Sviatoslav, the father of Ihor, and Vesvolod had vanquished the pagans and conquered their land. The people glorified Sviatoslav the terrible, but Ihor they hated. They reproached him who sank his wealth to the bottom of the Kayala, the Polovtsian River. He filled it with the gold of the Rus. Now Prince Ihor dismounted from his saddle of gold into a slave's saddle. So golden-tongued Sviatoslav wept, saying, Alas, my children, too early did ye wish for fame, too early you journeyed forth, seeking to conquer the land of the Polovtsi. No honor could come of this. Your brave hearts were bound in iron and forged in the fire of valor, but ye have brought sorrow upon my silvered head. The good wrought by my brother, the rich Yaroslav is no more. He, with his Chernihiv nobles and hosts, vanquished the pagans and upheld the honor of his forefathers. But ye, we will be men, ye said, and will take the glory that was our fathers for ourselves and make the glory of future times our own. But you said, let us ourselves be valorous. We shall steal the coining glory for ourselves and for ourselves divide the glory of the past. Thus cried Sviatoslav, and fain was he to save his children. Though the hawk be aged, yet does wish it to defend its young. But here is a prince's woe. I have no aid. The times have been turned about. Now in Rimov they call out beneath Polovitsian sabers, and Vladimir cries out beneath his wounds, anguish and sorrow to the son of Chleb. So he called to the princes of Russia that they might come to his aid. To Yaroslav, prince of Halich, mighty prince, come prince and kill Konchak the pagan, wipe out the wrong done to Russia, and take vengeance for the wounds of Ihor, fierce son of Sviatoslav. To Roman and Mstislav, princes of Volin, brave Roman, noble Mstislav, the light of Ihor is darkened, and sorrow has made the tree to weep leaves upon the ground. The heathen have taken the cities of Ros and Sula. The hosts of Ihor are dead, and the dawn cries to you for vengeance. And lastly, to Ingvar and Vesvolod, princes of Lutsk. The sons of Sviatoslav have gone to battle. Why tarry ye, ye lead-footed ones? Come ye to defend your land, wipe out the wrong done to Russia, and take vengeance for the wounds of Ihor, son of Sviatoslav. Yaroslavna, the beloved of Ihor, arose. I will go, she cried, to the Kayak River. Like a bird will I fly over the Danube. I will dip my hand in the water and wash the wounds of Prince Ihor and tend his torn body. She went upon the walls of Putivil and wept again. On the ramparts, Yaroslavna called at dawn, O wind, great wind, why, my lord, why do you blow so strongly? Why do you carry arrows of the Khan upon your own light wings against the warriors of my beloved? Was it too little for you to blow upwards into the clouds, carrying ships on the blue sea? Why, Lord, have you scattered my joy through the feather grass? She called from the ramparts, Odnipro, son of fame, you have cut through rocky mountains into the Polovtsian lands. You have cradled upon yourself the boats of Sviatoslav to meet Kubayak's host. My Lord, cradle my beloved to me, so that I need not send tears so soon to him upon the sea. And she looked upon the sun at dawn. Bright sun, she cried, bright sun, thou art so warm and beautiful. To all men art thou kind. And yet, sir son, you didst punish my beloved with cruel flames. In the waterless steps thou didst parch his bowstrings so that they could not bend for thirst. And thou didst fill his quiver with sorrows. Ah, woeful was the day when I first wept for him. At midnight, the sea began to splash. Water spouts approached like mists. God shows Prince Ihor the way from the Polovtsian land onto the land of the Rus, to his father's golden throne. The lights of evening have gone out. Ihor sleeps. Ihor wakes. 
He measures the step in his thought from the great dawn to the little Donets. A horse at midnight. Ovler whistles across the river. He warns the prince that he ought not to remain there. Ovler shouted. The ground rumbled. The grass rustled. The Polovtsian tent stirred. But Prince Ihor had dashed like an ermine to the weeds, like a white gold eye to the water. He leaped onto his swift horse and jumped down from him as a white-footed wolf and sped toward the bend of the Donets and flew as a falcon beneath the mist, slaying geese and swans for all his meals. If Ihor flew as a falcon, then Ovler sped as a wolf, shaking the cold dew from himself for they had worn down their swift horses, yet they ran faster than the wolves. In the camp, Znak and Goschak were awakened by the sound of hooves. Though their spirits were still dulled by wine, they roused their warriors and hastened in pursuit. The Donets spoke, O oh, Prince Ihor, there is no little greatness for you, but for Konchak there is anger and joy for the land of Rus. Ihor spoke, O oh, Donets, there is no little greatness for you, having carried a prince on your waves, spreading green grass for him on your silvery banks, clothing him in warm mists under the shadow of the green tree. You guarded him with a gold eye on the water, gulls on your currents, and lapwings on high winds. Not such was the river Srugna, having a poor current, devouring other brooks and streams spreading out at its mouth. At its dark banks, as the Dnipro it closed over young prince Rostislav, his mother weeps for the young prince. The flowers droop in sorrow, and the tree with sadness is bent toward the earth. So Donetsk took compassion on Prince Ihor and opened his arms to him, and he was safe. Magpies did not chatter, ravens did not caw. Zak and Konchak were on Ihor's trail. And Zak said to Konchak, If the falcon flies to his nest, we will shoot the falconet with our golden arrows. Konchak said to Zak, If the falcon flies to his nest, we will snare the falconet with a beautiful maiden. And Zak said to Konchak, in turn, If we snare him with a beautiful maiden, we will lose both her and the falconet, and birds will start striking us in the Polovitsin steppe. What bliss was there in Russia, brethren, when Ihor reached the land of his fathers and knelt before the Holy Virgin at Pirogosk. Henceforth did the warriors prosper and win great battles against the pagans. The sun shone more brightly. The maidens sang, Joy, joy! And the sound of their rejoicing was heard from the Danube to Kiev. The cities, too, and all the land took up the joyful song. Having sung a song to the old princes, then one should be obliged to sing a song to the young. Glory to Ihor Sviatoslavich, to his brother Vesevolod, and to Volodymyr Ihorovich. May the princes and their Druzhina prosper, fighting the pagans for God. Glory to the princes and their Druzhina. It was at the feast I heard this tale, there it was I drank mead ale. Though it flowed down my beard, my mouth stayed dry, for never a drop passed my lips where I.